a lot of trauma that comes with trafficking. There's a lot of damage a trafficker can cause to your physique, physical being, okay? So we work to fill those gaps for adult American victims of trafficking. The reason we picked that group is they were largely being ignored and cast off as prostitutes that nobody really wanted to care. At least 80 something percent and now with prostitution is going to be internet based. Like if you know that if someone is responding to trafficking the wrong way, I'm like, where are the protests? Where's the anger? Where's the indignation, right? To get them to stop. The youngest for our division we ever recovered was a four-year-old, stuff like that. So that was pretty sad, but we ended up, you know, luckily one of our officers was able to, you know, Troll Craigslist and as well, he was the first person to respond to the ad to where he was able to make an engagement with uh, the dad to where making, you know, he was selling his four-year-old daughter to where we, you know, recovered her. And actually he was the first one at a list of at least eight people that were in line to go into, you know, have an engagement with that little female, stuff like that little four-year-old. A lot of times recruiters would monitor the social media to see somebody like having a problem with their family, somebody not getting to go certain places, and somebody was slipping their DMs saying, hey, look, I, if you wanted to go, I'll take you. I think you're very attractive and stuff, and I want you to, you know, experience that. So, hey, come hang out with me. And a lot of our stuff starts off as, you know, hey, uh, boyfriend, girlfriend level. Then it ends up being, hey, you know what? Yeah, I, I thought he loved me. And now we're over here in some, uh, you know, Tucson, Arizona, and I came to Houston, and now he's making me work the streets.
there's a lot of trauma that comes with trafficking. There's a lot of damage a trafficker can cause to your physique, physical being, okay? So we work to fill those gaps for adult American victims of trafficking. The reason we picked that group is they were largely being ignored and cast off as prostitutes that nobody really wanted to care. At least 80 something percent and now with prostitution, it's going to be internet based. Like if you know that if someone is responding to trafficking the wrong way, I'm like, where are the protests? Where's the anger? Where's the indignation, right? To get them to stop. The youngest for our division we ever recovered was a four-year-old, stuff like that. So that was pretty sad, but we ended up, you know, luckily one of our officers was able to, you know, troll Craigslist and as well, he was the first person to respond to the ad to where he was able to make an engagement with uh, the dad to where making, you know, he was selling his four-year-old daughter to where we, you know, recovered her. And actually he was the first one at a list of at least eight people that were in line to go into, you know, have an engagement with that little female, stuff like that, little four-year-old. A lot of times recruiters would monitor the social media to see somebody like having problems with their family, somebody not getting to go certain places, and somebody was slipping their DMs, sitting there, hey, look, I, if you wanted to go, I'll take you. I think you're very attractive and stuff, and I want you to, you know, experience that. So, hey, come hang out with me. And a lot of our stuff starts off as, you know, hey, uh, boyfriend, girlfriend level. Then it ends up being, hey, you know what? Yeah, I, I thought he loved me. And now we're over here in some, uh, you know, Tucson, Arizona, and I came to Houston, and now he's making me work the streets.
there's a lot of trauma that comes with trafficking. There's a lot of damage a trafficker can cause to your physique, physical being, okay? So we work to fill those gaps for adult American victims of trafficking. The reason we picked that group is they were largely being ignored and cast off as prostitutes that nobody really wanted to care. At least 80 something percent but now with prostitution, it's going to be internet based. Look, if you know that if someone is responding to trafficking the wrong way, I'm like, where are the protests? Where's the anger? Where's the indignation, right? To get them to stop. The youngest for our division we ever recovered was a four-year-old, stuff that. So that was pretty sad. But we end up, you know, luckily one of our officers was able to, you know, troll Craigslist and as well. He was the first person to respond to the ad to where he was able to make an engagement with uh, the dad to where making, you know, he was selling his four-year-old daughter to where we, you know, recovered her. And actually, he was the first one at a list of at least eight people that were in line to go. In the, you know, have an engagement with that little female, stuff like that, little four-year-old. A lot of times recruiters would monitor the social media to see somebody like having a problem with their family, somebody not getting to go certain places, and somebody would slip in their DMs, sitting there, hey, look, if you wanted to go, I'll take you. I think you're very attractive and stuff, and I want you to, you know, experience that. So, hey, come hang out with me. And a lot of our stuff starts off as, you know, hey, uh, boyfriend, girlfriend level. Then it ends up being, a, hey, you know what? Yeah, I, I thought he loved me. And now we're over here in some, uh, you know, Tucson, Arizona. And I came to Houston, and now he's making me work the streets. Good evening. I'm Gabriela Santos, a freshman majoring in advertising. And I'm Sian Black, a junior majoring in political science. We are a part of the team of students who spent the semester researching human trafficking in the Americas. Tonight we will unveil some of what we discovered. Loyola alum Professor Ty Lawson developed this class as part of his role as the inaugural Marion M. and John S. Stokes Jr. Visiting Professor in Race and Culture and Media in the School of Com Communication and Design at the College of Music and Media. Under the banner of Media That Matters, Professor Lawson is exposing the powerful impact of media to students across this campus. I took this class to further my knowledge on human trafficking so that I can educate those around me. 
and I took this class because I wanted to learn more about human trafficking and be more informed on the subject. Tonight, we're going to take you on a journey, and it starts now. Good evening, I'm Alexis Marini. I'm Brooklyn Joyner. And I'm Anna Hummel. And I'm Devin Kurt. Welcome to another edition of Media That Matters. Tonight we're examining human trafficking in the Americas. Human trafficking compromises the dignity and worth of 28 million people across the globe every single day. The number of people being trafficked equates to more than the population of the third largest city in the world. The reality of modern day slavery is hidden behind mountains of misinformation. And our map is tearing down barriers by consolidating facts to make the public aware these crimes are happening every day in front of our eyes. And we may have all signed up for this class for different reasons, but one thing is for sure. We knew we weren't the only students taking this journey. Here's what some of our counterparts at the Universidad Astro in Argentina had to say about our joint adventure. Take a watch. Hello, my name is Benar Rosito Kremer, and I have chosen to work on trafficking and sex trafficking of women and children from Mexico to the United States. The reason for my choice is that the U.S.-Mexico border region is a key area, as the CIA has estimated that there are between 45 and 50,000 people trafficked into the United States every year. If we focus on San Diego, between 3,000 and 7,000 women are sex trafficked through the county each year, with the average of the victims being just 16. As of 2010, Mexico is rated the second worst country when it comes to child prostitution globally. Amongst other reasons, this has been the result of government ineffectiveness and corruption, which has corroded the trust of the Mexican people in their government. I chose to study Mexican women from 18 to 25 years old that are trafficked from Mexico to the United States through the Teumaulipas district to the Texas state, um, uh, which is a, specially, a special zone because there are a lot of twin cities uh, and many people offer um, immigrants uh, to, to enter through the USA through them, uh, taking advantage of their vulnerable situation, social, economic, gender situation, especially women, um, and promise them a better life in the USA and end up uh, selling them as a force uh, for labor work or for sex labor. Uh, so I chose to study them because I empathize a lot with women who, women who want to um, escape their realities and uh, end up being caught in a traffic organization. Before we start our journey, let's find out what human trafficking is. Blair Anderson and Chloe Cottle are here to explain. Thanks, Brooklyn. The United Nations defines human trafficking as the recruitment, transportation, transfer, harboring, or receipt of people through force, fraud, or deception with the aim of exploiting them for profit. The root causes of trafficking vary and differ from country to country. 
Trafficking is a complex phenomenon that is often driven or influenced by social, economic, cultural, and other factors. Men, women, and children of all ages and backgrounds can become victims of this crime, which occurs in every region of the world. In fact, it could happen to any of you. While there are many different perspectives on exactly what human trafficking may be, I decided to get one that may be viewed as crucial for society to progress in reducing trafficking. I was able to interview a local sheriff's deputy on his perspective on human trafficking. The deputy has chosen to remain anonymous, so pronouns will be used for reference purposes. When asked if human trafficking is a local problem, he made it clear, it is. The deputy says because New Orleans is a port city with a large population and has a higher crime rate, it offers traffickers the ideal conditions. But the most shocking response he gave was that in fact he does not believe he would recognize trafficking. Speaking with the deputy reminded me that awareness is key. Misinformation runs deep. Human trafficking may not be trendy enough for the media to blast, but some serious reform needs to occur. Human trafficking is not a war on just the traffickers themselves, but also on the media and politicians who enable modern day slavery to happen. When we talk about the fundamental causes of trafficking, we often focus on how people's identities can make them vulnerable. And as transphobia surges, the anti-trafficking community, especially cisgender allies, are being urged to do more to support transgender survivors. Alexis, I was able to talk to House of Tulip, which is a nonprofit here in New Orleans that supports transgender and gender non-conforming people. Because of their gender and sexuality, they are extremely discriminated against, leaving them with essentially no resources. When you ask most of the average trans girl, has she ever been pimped or has she ever been trafficked, most of us will immediately say no. Trans woman Milan Nicole Sherry is a survivor of sex trafficking. For many of us, when we're in the midst of it, we weren't able to identify what it is. But for many of us who have overcome many of those hurdles and boundaries, looking back at our experiences, we can call the things for what they are. In a sense, it was all done for survival. 469 anti-LGBTQ plus bills were reported to exist across the U.S. We're not afforded the opportunities. We are kicked out of our homes. We don't have the support. You know, um, we find ourselves um, in situations that are very dangerous. Sherry, who is one of the five founders of the nonprofit House of Tulip, gives support like housing, food, clothing, and social work to transgender and non-conforming people. My boyfriend, who I was dating while I was engaging in sex work, I would have never considered him a pimp, right? But in reality, he was. Sherry dealt with Romeo pimping. But he used his kindness, right? He used his affection, he used his love um, to manipulate me. Which is very different from the violent gorilla pimping that is more well known. He wasn't the aggressive pimp, right? He didn't get out there, he didn't beat me, he didn't do all these things, he didn't inject me up with drugs or shoot me up with drugs. So many of our community members um, have lost their lives, um, have lost their minds. We are a safe space for community members um, to come. If an individual is Unfortunately, um, caught up in a situation where they're being trafficked or abused. The only people who know the location of the property are those that are housed at that property, and we do it that way because we understand that people are coming from many different backgrounds and walks of life, and we don't know what situations or backgrounds people are, are fleeing from. You just have a lot of odds um, that are stacked up against trans and gender non-conforming individuals 
Um, and all we're trying to do is literally trying to just navigate, trying to find out where we fit at in this big, big world and just have the things that we need so we can exist, so we can continue to thrive, so we can um, have the tools that we need to be successful just as well as everyone else. This is Brooklyn Joyner reporting. Max Hemperly, Forrest Woods, and Jack Pappas are here now with a look at a group that is often downplayed when it comes to human trafficking. Amen. Another sector of the population thriving in invisibility are male trafficking victims. The UN's 2020 Global Report on Trafficking in Persons found that boys and men accounting, account for a bigger share of known victims as new forms of exploitation emerge. There's a myth, or perhaps persistent bias, that male trafficking victims are automatically labor trafficking victims. The truth is, is that there's a significant number of males that are sex trafficked. Experts admit that reported numbers can be much higher because male victims are unwilling to speak out of fear and common stereotypes, like men are supposed to be strong. Boys and men who have been trafficked experience the same vulnerab vulnerabilities as women and girls, issues such as poverty, housing, and domestic violence. But male victims get far less attention from law enforcement and social services than females. In many states, there are no programs or shelters focused on helping exploited males. Over the past decade, United Nations found that the number of boys and men being trafficked has been detected in greater numbers. An increasing proportions of male victims have been trafficked for the purpose of being forced to commit crimes and other exploitations while being prey to both sex trafficking and forced labor. Since 2019, there's been a rise in identifying male victims, which echoes the rapid spike we've seen over the last five years. trafficking, we must start by listening to survivors, bearing witness to their experiences. To help us get a better grasp of this, Julia Persari went one-on-one -on -one with a survivor. Julia? Thanks, Devin. I sat down with survivor-turned-advocate Shaley Lockridge-Combs. Here's her story. I met a guy that, um, on, while I was on runaway, that said they'd take care of me, and I believe that, because um, I just to me, it was like, okay, I don't have to go back to a group home, you know, and I can do what I want, and I'm invincible, and nothing's gonna happen. Uh, but instead, I wound up on Airline Highway. And Airline Highway back in the day was what Bourbon Street is now, the track, what Shefton Tour Highway is. Um, there was a lot of prostitution going on and pimping. And it was not maybe 30 minutes, you know, and I could be off about that, but. That's how it felt like within a sh very short time of entering the motel room, having the first guy come in and having um, to exchange sex for money and thinking, wow, I really got myself into something now. And I remember crying and vomiting and realizing it was not a choice. Like I wasn't just gonna be able to walk away from this person. Um, just feeling sick to my stomach and thinking, how am I gonna get out of this? And, you know, I, I work with clients every day now that, you know, they're trauma bonded to their traffickers. Um, and that didn't happen, thank God, for me. I saw him as the repulsive, evil person he was. And, uh, you know, I, I worked to, like, build his trust and work to be able to leave that motel room to go to the store um, and wound up on the bus Scared to death, he would, you know, catch me before I got on the bus. Scared to death, he'd find me once I got on that bus. And not really knowing where I was going once I got on it. But I found myself downtown New Orleans. I met some other homeless youth, um, mostly boys, that were also being trafficked in the streets of the quarter. 
and living in an abandoned parking garage for four months, not having access to water, plumbing, food, showers, you know, everyday needs. the psychological impact trafficking has on victims. Camilla? Brooklyn, tonight I want to discuss a couple of behaviors and the aftermath effects people display in trauma, particularly those who have been victims of human trafficking. Studies show that individuals who have been victims of trafficking exhibit signs of anxiety, emotional numbness, memory loss, and depression. They're, they're more prone to develop PTSD, or a strong dependence on drugs or alcohol and, and or an eating disorder. Researchers say these consequences can be long lasting. Human trafficking victims can also be stripped of the ability to form healthy, meaningful relationships. Trust and sometimes faith are lost. Doctors say that's because of the stigma and misinformation about trafficking and the people involved with their so-called re-entry into society. These are also, there, there is also the feeling of helplessness, that one will not experience positive emotions or an improvement in their condition. This can lead to major depressive episodes and other depressive disorders, and it's often implicated in suicide and attempted suicide. Being in a safe space does not mean that survivors have conquered their horrific experience, experiences. During this transitional period of separation, of separating themselves from that experience may, can, may cause to revisit trauma. And there's also the possibility of Stockholm Syndrome. This is a psychological condition that can cause a victim to identify and empathize with the capturer or abuser and their goals. Many trafficking victims are brainwashed or coerced into trafficking. The bottom line is that at the end of the day, we may not know their full story or what's going on with a victim, but science says trauma, no matter how big or small, is something that should be approached slowly and with maturity. Awareness can influence change in the way society views survivors. There's a lot of trafficking rumors on social, no, oh, pardon me, on social media. But, <coughs> sorry. But sometimes knowing what's true is just knowing the difference between fact or fiction. A billion people use TikTok every month, and they may have seen videos like this one that claim to educate people about the dangers of human trafficking. Apparently, that's like sex trafficking. Oh, I've seen this TikTok. I have. I've seen them on TikTok. Some said zip ties on door handles were a sign of how people could easily spot and avoid being trafficked. It can happen to like anybody. It doesn't matter like your gender. But it's videos like these that can also spread misinformation about human trafficking. The, the going to Walmart and you come out and there's something on your windshield and, and things of that nature. They're not helpful, and it's just not how trafficking works. Sherry Combs from Covenant House in New Orleans says these videos are part of the problem. Force can play a role in human trafficking, but that coercion is much more effective on a victim than the force itself. In 2021, over 10,000 cases of human trafficking were reported to the National Human Trafficking Hotline. And experts say 90% of those were lured in by somebody they know. That could be family members, intimate partners, or employers. 
Most victims will tell you that they knew their trafficker or they were introduced to their trafficker and there was a long-standing grooming period. Covenant House helps people that have been victims of human trafficking. We have served hundreds of victims of human trafficking, providing them with safe shelter, moving them to safe houses if necessary. They rely on national groups like the Polaris Project, which collects data in an effort to stop human trafficking. They want people to know what really happens to survivors. There's always that whole phase of manipulation and making you feel like you're the only one in the whole wide world. Right? Alexis Marini reporting. Let's be honest, most people are terrible at understanding big numbers. In fact, two neuroscientists explained it this way. Numbers are a useful, clear, and efficient way to summarize, but the brain simply can't understand what it means that a million people have died. The same can be said about why most people struggle to process this even bigger number. The 28 million people trapped in human trafficking situations globally, think about it this way, that's equal to the population of D.C., Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, and North Carolina combined. To break down this number, let's look at the journey through the Americas. For those being trafficked, it is often no different than the ones taken by migrants braving dangerous conditions in search of what they hope is a better life. Research from Hispanic-serving institutions helped us navigate this journey. Gabriela Castillo, Isabella Lopez, and Daniela Martinez join me to explain. The typical journey for people being trafficked from El Salvador to the United States is 37 days. For those coming from Guatemala, to the U.S. it takes about a month at th three days. Victims coming from Nicaragua travel for 42 days to get to the U.S. from being trafficked. And in Mexico, the journey to the U.S. takes 19 days, but adding to the complexity of the modern day slave routes in the Americas is the fact that Colombia and Ecuador, which each take 68 days to reach the U.S., are also major transit hubs from Europe and Asia to the U.S. In 2000, the U.S. government enacted the Victims of Trafficking and Violence Protection Act. It equips the federal government with resources to mount a coordinated campaign to eliminate trafficking domestically and internationally. Each year, the state's departments to offer to um, excuse the state department's office to monitor and control and sorry y'all combat trafficking in persons, divide nations into tiers based on their compliance to the Trafficking Victims Protection Act or TVPA, and those tiers are Tier One countries whose governments fully comply with TVPA minimum standards. Tier two, countries whose governments do not fully comply but are making significant strides to do so. Uh, tier two watch list countries are those making efforts but remain under the watch of the Secretary of State's office. And tier three countries do not fully comply and are found to not have any effort at doing so. The TVPA works in tandem with the United Nations Protocol on Trafficked Persons, which is the first legally binding instrument with an internationally recognized definition of human trafficking. Countries that ratify this must criminalize human trafficking and develop anti-trafficking laws in line with the protocol's legal provisions. As you can see, most of the world has signed on to this treaty, but we took a deeper dive into countries in the Americas. Sian, Anna, Isabella, Gabriella, Alexis Carino, Daniela, and Camilla have more on the trafficking in Central America. Brooklyn. 
In Honduras, the government has increased its prosecution efforts by amending the anti-trafficking provision. Penalties were increased for the crimes of sex and labor trafficking from five to eight years sentences to 10 to 15 years. The government has also enforced strong prosecution efforts for victims of trafficking. Honduras has also increased the number of, working, of officers working at the border at all entry points to curb trafficking. As it stands, Honduras remains at tier two according to TVPA. El Salvador is a country known to have a large number of gangs. According to the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley, experts have reported that gang-related violence has led to a displacement of 269,000 people. The dynamics of human trafficking in El Salvador are not completely known. Right now, El Salvador is on the Tier 2 watch list. The Watch Freeze Global Slavery Index estimated that 18,000 people in Nicaragua were living in modern slavery in 2018. Nicaragua is a common transit point for migrants traveling between South and North America. Migrants are one of the groups facing the highest risk of human trafficking and exploitation. The government of Nicaragua, despite being a party to multiple international anti-trafficking treaties and protocols, still does not meet the minimum standards for the elimination of trafficking and is not making significant efforts to do so, which is why Nicaragua downgraded from Tier 2 to Tier 3 in 2020. In Guatemala, the government does not fully meet the minimum standards of el elimination of trafficking, but it is making significant efforts to do so. In March, the U.S. Justice Department announced the first smuggling extradition from Guatemala to the U.S. in nearly five years. Only 4% of human trafficking victims in Guatemala are actually from there. Guatemala is part of the C4 visa area, which establishes that citizens of those countries can travel freely back and forth. This makes Guatemala an attractive location to relocate for economical purposes. Of approximately 50,000 sex trafficking victims reported in Guatemala, almost 60% of those are children. There are only two prosecutors uh, countrywide who are working solely on sex trafficking cases. Because of this, human trafficking convictions in Guatemala are extremely low. Right now, Guatemala is a member of the Tier 2 group. In the Dominican Republic, women and children have been reportedly subjected to forced sex there and throughout the Caribbean, Europe, South America, and the United States. According to the 2022 Trafficking in Persons Report, the Dominican Republic has increased efforts to combat trafficking but the Dominican Republic government does not always apply minimum sentences as required by law. They also have yet to remove the requirement to prove fr force, fraud, or coercion for sex trafficking victims under the age of 18. As it stands, the Dominican Republic is a tier two country. Groups considered most at risk for trafficking in Mexico include unaccompanied children, indigenous persons, persons with mental and physical disabilities, asylum seekers and migrants, people forced to leave their homes, LGBTQI plus individuals, informal sector workers, and children in gang controlled territories. The majority of trafficking cases in Mexico involve family, intimate partners, acquaintances on social media, or employment related traps. Transgender people are particularly vulnerable to sex trafficking. Traffickers increasingly use the internet especially social media, to target and recruit potential victims. Traffickers exploit Mexican adults and children in forced labor industries such as agriculture, child care, and food processing in Mexico and the U.S. Also fueling the vast trafficking route through Mexico is China. In April, Mexico's president wrote a letter to his Chinese counterpart pleading with him to control the shipment of fentanyl. Right now, the synthetic opioid is being blamed for the fueling surge in overdose deaths in the U.S. And U.S. lawmakers say Mexico is not doing enough to stop cartels from trafficking the pain, powerful painkiller. So what's China's role in this? Over the last few years, China's presence in Mexico has expanded in both legal and illegal activities. According to the preliminary data, trade between China and Mexico topped the record of $100 billion in 2021. 
But while legitimate commerce between Mexico and China is growing, Chinese groups are also becoming more involved in drug trafficking and money laundering in Mexico. U.S. officials contend that opioid is mass-produced using chemicals from China. And adding to the speculation is the fact that even before the fentanyl surge, illegal routes were already thriving since 1978 when U.S. and China established diplomatic relations. Chinese nationals overwhelmed legal channels to immigrate to the U.S. Consequently, human smugglers, called snakes, developed a network of illegal pipelines to transport Chinese nationals into the U.S. A Justice Department study of Chinese human trafficking into the U.S. found snakeheads were otherwise ordinary citizens whose social networks provided the necessary connections and resources that led to a profitable trade shipping human cargo around the world. And one of their main routes is through Mexico into the U.S. Those brought in are being trafficked in sex labor and in some cases both, all across this nation. This complex web, complex web of trafficking has Mexico as a tier two country. Now Blair Anderson and Chloe Bernier will take us to South America. In 2022, Argentina was one of the 30 countries leading the fight against trafficking in the world, according to the U.S. State Department's annual trafficking in persons report. Between 2018 and 2022, open data portal of the Argentina Justice established nearly 9,000 complaints of trafficking. The majority of those complaints were sexual exploitation followed by labor exploitation and misleading recruiting or job offers. 72% of the calls were from women, and even though it is prohibited, there are 8,000 brothels in the country. Each of them enslaves between three and five women. This means the total number of trafficking victims ranges between 24 and 40,000, not counting street or online sex work. Even though Argentina is a tier one country, data shows that budgeting and evidence-based decisions are needed to move forward and truly lead the rankings. Venezuela joined the UN protocol to prevent, suppress, and punish trafficking of persons more than 20 years ago, but much has changed in the country since then. President Nicolas Maduro's mining initiative has led to an increase in human trafficking. In 2016, he created the special mining zone that spans over 24% of the country's rainforests. There have been many reports of this mining region being used as a hot spot for human trafficking, specifically sex trafficking. Victims are lured to the region with promise of good jobs and work and then forced into sex work. Right now, Venezuela is a tier three country, not even meeting the minimum TVPA standards. And in Brazil, human trafficking is an ongoing problem. Brazil is a source country for men, women, girls, and boys subjected to human trafficking, specifically forced prostitution, both within the country and abroad in places as far away as Japan. Men and boys are also used for forced labor in Brazil. Transgender women are a population especially vulnerable to trafficking. In 2019, U.S. State Department study found 90% of transgender women in Brazil are in commercial sex, and those in Rio de Janeiro, more than half are in situation at high risk for human trafficking. In recent years, the Brazilian government increased efforts to prevent human trafficking. Right now, Brazil is a tier two country. Human trafficking happens in every state in the United States. It's an economy thriving in invisibility. 
trafficking crimes are taking place across the nation in restaurants, massage parlors, rural farms, and on street corners. It could be happening right by our homes, in our own neighborhoods. We start with Mia Wen. Alexis, a federal investigation last month found that in California, garment workers have fallen victim to labor trafficking and were being paid $1.58 an hour. California is one of the largest sites of human trafficking due to its proximity to international borders, the number of ports and airports, its significant immigration population, and a large economy that includes industries that attract forced labor. All of these factors makes it easier for human traffickers to receive or transport victims. According to the National Human Trafficking Hotline, more than 1,300 cases in California were identified in 2021 with over 2,000 victims involved. Most victims were from Thailand, Mexico, and Russia. Now Brooklyn, Gabriella, Sophia Bornfeld, Sydney Broxton, and Bree continue our journey. New York is ranked fourth by the National Human Trafficking Hotline when it comes to the number of incidents of trafficking reported. The Administration for Children's Services says that over 2,000 young people in New York City were believed to have been sexually exploited or at risk for sexual exploitation in 2019. In New York, most traffickers use social media to lure vulner vulnerable victims with the promises of money, shelter, or food. And while the pandemic led to a drop in those numbers, the issue remains a big problem. The state has passed 25 laws combating trafficking. Since 2005, Georgia has been one of the leading states in the United States when it comes to how high volumes of human trafficking. Cities like Savannah and Atlanta are hot spots that cause Georgia's human trafficking numbers to increase. Atlanta is attractive to human traffickers because of its huge airport. Hartsfield Jackson Atlanta International continues to be voted one of the busiest airports in the world with 100 million passengers passing through every single day. Experts say it's easy for traffickers to move victims through places like this without drawing so much attention to themselves. In 2019, Georgia's Attorney General launched a unit to, buy, to put buyers and traffickers behind bars. They teamed up with agency, agencies across the state to make this happen. Missouri's definition for human trafficking tells us how traffickers take control of an individual but does not specify the ways that these individuals may be held. The state's definition does not specify the reason or the steps, just how it occurs. Even with enacting legislation to combat trafficking, there were 240 reported cases in Missouri, according to the National Human Trafficking Hotline. But stats from the UN paint a much bleaker picture for Missouri. UN findings in 2021 show over 10,000 situations of human trafficking being reported, with nearly 17,000 victims involved. numbers don't lie, then why are they so different? It seems as though some states do all they can to hide their true statistics on the matter. For example, Texas and Mississippi have some of the highest trafficking rates in the nation, but Louisiana, which is sandwiched between them, appears to have significantly less on paper. Why might this be? Well, there are a couple of reasons. For one, going back to the previous point, Louisiana, like most states, does not always report human trafficking cases. If a case truly falls under a human trafficking conviction violation, officials might report the crime as something else. This in turn dilutes the growing trafficking number. There will never be a truly accurate number available because many victims are trapped within their trafficking rings. Bree's here now to take us across the border to Texas. Sydney. Just last year in Texas, the National Human Trafficking Hotline identified 917 cases. That involved over 1,700 victims. There are multiple forms of trafficking that are prevalent in Texas. According to the National Human Trafficking Hotline, last year in Texas, more than 600 adults and 200 minors were involved in trafficking. The majority of these victims are survivors and were foreign nationals. In 2019, Florida was ranked third in the nation for the number of human trafficking cases reported to the National Human Trafficking Hotline. In 
2021, Florida passed a bill that expands the state's efforts to prevent human trafficking. It includes provisions that require certain businesses, such as hotels and massage parlors, to post human trafficking awareness signs and to train employees to recognize and report trafficking. The bill also creates a registry of individuals convicted of soliciting prostitution, which can help law enforcement agencies identify and track potential traffickers. Turning now to Louisiana, often when you think of human trafficking, the first thing that might come to your mind is sex trafficking. Never do we think about the American dream turning into a nightmare. We all know the disaster that was Hurricane Katrina. It caused $161 billion worth of damage. But one construction company tried to use this tragedy in their favor. In India, 500 men were promised the American dream. For $20,000 each, they were offered work repairing oil rigs that were damaged during the storm in Pascagoula. But their dream soon turned into a nightmare. Instead of green cards, the men were given H-2B visas. This type of visa is temporary and restricts who that person can work for. In this case, the men could only work for Signal International. If so many people to, to, to a trailer, uh, it's, it's, it's one bathroom. The men were crammed, 24 to a trailer, and they lived on what used to be a toxic waste dump and forced to work dusk till dawn. And the company brags about, well, we spent a million dollars creating this place, this place for housing them. I don't care how much they spent. It was a, who would, would any of them want to live there? Would anybody who would, uh, in that company want to live there for a week, let alone for months and months and months? When the men finally had enough, they started looking for a way out. The Great Escape, written by author and labor organizer Safit Soni, tells that story. It's, it's gut-wrenching how he was able to, to fathom this, stay, stay connected, and, and, and then with the legal supports, began to, to really unravel this knot. But not all of the men were on board. One worker was adamantly against the escape. Mr. Quant told me that if this man did not get on board, no one else would until that man had to interpret Quant's speech for the workers that didn't speak English. By him having to say the words, say the words with passion, for him to be up there seeing the workers rising and cheering from what was being said, he was won over. The speech inspired them, and the escape plan went into action. After bribing the guards with cigars and liquor, the men fled to a cramped hotel. Their pleads with the Department of Justice fell on deaf ears. With no response and no options, they marched from New Orleans to Washington, D.C. Giant Goliath before this David of immigrant workers trapped in this situation is a story of tremendous courage and, and ups and downs and ultimately victory. And more than a decade after arriving in the U.S., the men went to trial against Signal International and won just last year in December. Supporters hope this win serves as a warning to any company planning to dupe immigrant workers. Louisiana is ground zero for forced labor, partly because the state is home to Louisiana State Penitentiary, commonly known as Angola. The prison occupies an 18,000-acre former plantation that's larger than the island of Manhattan. Most people assume the 13th Amendment abolished slavery in the United States, but the reality is there is a single exception, forced prison labor. During our first installment of Media That Matters, we discussed forced prison labor. We heard from Ingrid Hamilton and Landon Marshall, both of whom were incarcerated in Louisiana's prison system. Here's what they had to say about their experience with forced labor. Let me just say that, you know, uh, that's just two cents an hour. Come on, what kind of that? Nothing. You know, uh, if I got to save up 50 years in order to get a decent amount from those two cents, but they're going to take some of that, right? Because you don't just get that. Because you have to pay for sick calls and medications or whatever else. You know, you have to pay for that. It's not for free. So I think, you know, that's just like a joke. I just thank God that, you know, I had my, my dad. I realized that when I first got to Angola, uh, waking me up 6 o'clock in the morning as we go work in the field, two cent an hour was out for that cause. It's not right. 
And Lynn and Ingrid aren't the only people who were subjected to what many call modern day slavery. Recently, I met up with Alan Lynn. He spent over 20 years in the Louisiana prison system and is now home rebuilding his life. But you have to be a good slave in order for you to maneuver within a slave system. Alan Wynn was incarcerated for 23 years. He says he has seen firsthand how forced prison labor has broken men around him. I've seen men where they end up falling off to just becoming a good slave, right? Um, and then delegate themselves to just that. Like, this is what my, my, my life amounts to. Desiring to have more is, is, is not, not in that in their cards anymore, you know? In a way, it looks like many men I met that were broken by the system. He also says that prison destroys individuality. Prison is the equalizer, that you're strictly just a digit. In this case, a six letter, a six number digit, your DOC number. And that's who you are, and that's how they see you, cattle. He worked his way up to be the governor's butler. His pay topped at 20 cents an hour. So I worked for him for different catering events. And eventually that just progressed where they loved my character. And through the grace of God, I ended up working at the governor's mansion. State Representative Mandy Landry and others say they are working from the Capitol to address this problem. I think it's important that people don't understand that those who are incarcerated, number one, working for no money or four cents an hour is not part of their sentence. Um, they're removed from society, that's their sentence. She says companies that rely on prison labor for profit have a hole in their business plan. And so many of them can only make a profit, or they say they can only make a profit because they don't have to pay for labor. Well, I mean, maybe you shouldn't be in business if, if, if you have to pay for labor. You don't have space to really feel about it. It's all, there, it's, all, it's all about surviving, and that's it. This was Devin Cruz reporting. Nia and Max are back with a look at how the U.S. is ramping up efforts to end human trafficking. When workers call the National Human Trafficking Hotline to report abuses at their workplaces, one of the most common methods of control they mention is threats of deportation. But from now on, the Department of Homeland Security will expedite deferred actions for those workers who have experienced or witnessed sexual violations and would like to cooperate with the investigations. With these new guidelines, non-citizen workers can submit a deferred action request and an application for employer authorization. This holds any deportation proceedings and provides temporary immigration protections. Many states are now taking actions to combat human trafficking. A few weeks ago, Maryland and Virginia passed safe harbor laws to protect child victims of human trafficking. The vast majority of the trafficking survivors report having a criminal record as a result of having been trafficked. But the federal government fails to recognize this, leaving them to battle with the challenges associated with having a record. Luckily, most states acknowledge the effect this has on survivors struggling to heal and move forward with their lives. They have passed laws that provide a way for the survivors to clear their records. Even though these laws vary widely in terms of scope and effectiveness, they are all better than nothing, which is, for the moment, what the federal government offers.
A big part of recognizing human trafficking is knowing the story behind a situation rather than just knowing the sign. Chloe and Gabriella want to know if you Chloe and Gabriella want to know if you know it when you see it. You've been with us hearing all about human trafficking. It's time now to unpack some of what you heard and put it to the test. That's right. Question number one. In order to be in order for a situation to be considered trafficking, what must be present in addition to force, fraud, and or coercion? Is it A, the exchange of money or something of value, B, crossing of a border, C, abduction, or D, physical restrainment? The answer is A, the exchange of money or something of value. Question number two. How much human trafficking happens in the United States? Is it A, 150,000 people a year, B, 650,000 people a year, C, 4 million people a year, or D, there is no reliable number? The answer is D, there is no reliable number. Question number three. In which of these situations may amount to human trafficking? Is it A, landlords threatening to evict tenants who refuse sexual advances? <laughs> B, uh, children being put to, to work long hours in their family businesses rather than attending school? C, men purchasing mail order brides for the purpose of having someone to clean their house or to take care of their children? Or D, all of the above? Question number four is, can men and boys be victims of both sex and labor trafficking? Is it true or false? The answer is true. Men and boys can be victims of both sex and labor trafficking. Combating human trafficking requires you taking action. Your voice, your vote, they matter. The U.S. Department of Labor must have the resources to hire, train, and deploy inspectors who visit job sites and make sure workers are being treated fairly. Voters in Utah, Nebraska, and Colorado have already voted to remove language from their con state constitutions that allow for slavery or involuntary servitude to be used as votes to prison labor. It's time to do the same with the U.S. Constitution and human Taking forced prison labor out of the Constitution doesn't mean abolishing prison labor altogether. Many incarcerated people want to work, but the current system of forcing people to work for little or no pay, often in dangerous or unhealthy conditions, does not make our streets safer. It encourages a profit motive for sending people to prison, which has in turn led to the overwhelming mass incarceration of black Americans. At the same time, it is too easy for criminal networks to hide their true identity setting up illicit companies. Attorneys, accountants, and others that work for these businesses are currently exempt from having to ensure their clients are operating within the law. Congress has the power to close this loophole by passing the Bipartisan Enablers Act, helping to ensure that they are not empowering human trafficking. And finally, spread the word. Share a map, videos, articles, and graphics on social media to expand awareness of what human trafficking really looks like. <laughs> Tonight we've unpacked some insight on human trafficking. Now here's some ways you can help. Contact your elected representatives about supporting important legislation to combat this crime and help survivors. 
You can learn more about how human trafficking works and help educate others. And you can volunteer in your community to not only stop trafficking, but the factors that lead to it, including poverty, addiction, and hopelessness. Our map also includes a list of agencies leading the fight against trafficking. Thanks for joining us for another edition of Media That Matters. We'll, join it, we'll turn it over to Professor Lawson. Good night. Catch my breath. <clears throat> Good evening, I'm Ty Lawson. I am the Marion M. and John S. Stokes Jr. Visiting Professor in Race and Culture and Media at the School of Communication and Design in the College of Music and Media. Take a breath. First off, I would love for my students to stand. You understood the assignment? Job well done. Um, before this uh, event began, there was a slideshow playing and all the videos that the students made throughout the semester. I'm sorry, y'all can sit. No. <laughs> um, there was original music that played with it. And I want to thank Eduardo Diodato, who is a student in the College of Music and Media also, um, for composing 10 songs for us. And he did this all on just based on a conversation. So thank you very much for that. Um, I would also like to thank Cesar Rodriguez, who served as our web developer for our site. And uh, I also want to thank Virginia Armstrong, who is a student, a design student in SCD, who stepped in and she created a lot of amazing graphics for us. So I'm not sure if Virginia is here, but well done to you. Um, and I want to thank Professor Willie Horton's documentary film class because they shot the interview with um, one of our survivors, I believe, I'm sorry. They shot the interview with the survivors and they did a really good job with that. I um, also want to thank our collaborators and supporters throughout the semester. It truly does take a village. Uh, Sherry Lockridge Combs, who works for Covenant House here in New Orleans, who's a survivor turned advocate who was amazing to us. I'm not sure if she's here tonight, but I wanna thank her because she always stepped in and helped us whenever we needed. Also wanna thank Ted Quant, he's the Loyola uh, former Loyola employee who uh, was a labor organizer, and I recognized his name when I saw some uh, pictures about the men that were trafficked from India, and I found him, thankfully, and he was able to corroborate that story for us because he was the person that lit the fire under them to do what they did and escape. And that story fascinated me because it took place uh, in the weeks, or the year, I should say, or so after Katrina, but it never was really covered by the media. And it's now getting media light because uh, Socket decided to write a book and it came out, uh, I believe, last month. So the timing of what we're doing and with, with the book coming out, it's now truly getting attention to uh, a reality that so many people face and people in our state face that we had no idea about. So uh, hats off to 
Ted for helping us with that. I also want to thank Alan Wynn for sharing his story. Uh, Alan was, again, someone who served more than 20 years in the Louisiana prison system and is now rebuilding his life. And he had no problem with sitting down with Devin and talking and sharing his story. Um, I also want to thank Professor Andrea Armstrong, Dr. Dana Hunter, Minial Patel, Morella Beltran, Sergeant Antonio Gar Gracia Jr., Jennifer Paul Ray, Dr. Robert Hugh Porter, Angie De Luna, Katie Coonan, Alejandro Kennedy, Sarah Gazzalo, Renee Pellegrino, and Ingrid Hamilton and Landon Marshall for sharing their stories. All of those are people that throughout the semester the students were able to interact with and hear stories about what's going on. Um, human trafficking is something that I take very serious because I saw it happen and, and I didn't realize what it was. So that sparked my interest and that's what decided for me to create this class. Um, wow, never happens to me, but I'm so proud of this group because they didn't have to take this class and they did. Um, to make people who normally, even though some of them are communications majors, a lot of them are not journalism students, so they don't want to speak in front of crowds, and they don't necessarily have a, a background in writing news stories, but they stepped up. We had help from uh, the law school uh, senior librarian of research, as well as the Monroe Library, where they actually were able to research laws and protocols in the, whatever state or country they were assigned. So good job on that. And I really appreciate when they did the stories um, where they stepped out of their comfort zone. I know uh, Bree was a student who interviewed a law enforcement uh, officer, and I, I was very fascinated by it. And granted, we couldn't necessarily get that officer on camera, but I thought it was interesting to hear that story because that gives a, a, a really up close look at why we don't know what's going on around us. So thank you for doing that. Um, I also want to thank uh, Media Services and the Monroe Library. That is, I feel like I'm on their staff because I rely on them so much. Uh, so I want to thank them for always, always, always working with us. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Esteban Pitero. Uh, Professor Sofia Muratoro and her students from the Universidad of Austral for working with us. And um, there's a long list of Loyola people, so I have to, I uh, want to make sure I say this. Uh, Dr. Shara Heidel Kennedy, I'm sorry, Kennedy Heidel, who's the director of the School of Communication and Design and who uh, gave me the grace to create this class. Uh, also want to thank, um, really all of the staff that's like supported me and they always come to my events. Uh, uh, I appreciate that uh, Uncle Joe is what I always call Professor Duke. Uh, his office is next to mine. Olivia Scott, Dr. Rogers. Dr. Rogers was one of my professors, but now she's a colleague and they always show up to anything and they support uh, when my students do stuff. So thank you all for that. Um, Kyle and Carr, uh, who's the school photographer, because he's always really good about publicizing and taking pictures and uh, promoting the things that we're doing. Asha Thomas, uh, Dr. Aaron Dupe, Dr. Tanisha Singh, uh, for always, again, promoting and bringing awareness to what we're doing. Um, when I came up with the idea for Media That Matters, I knew I wanted to use it as an avenue to create classes that allow students from across Loyola's campus to gain a deeper appreciation of the media. Um, and seeing what they did tonight, it's like they thrived like no others. I don't know why I'm like this, but I think I'm like this because I like this group so much and um, I rely on them, like some of these students I had never met before until this semester, and me sending them a message and saying, hey, can you do this? Would you do this? And they all have just like elevated on so many levels. So thank you for that. And uh, we have a cake in the back, so I would love for you all to please join us, take it. Uh, it's 
bigger than I thought. Um, but some final words for you is from Edward R. Romero. Good night and good luck. Thank you.